Okay, hi everyone. So we'll get the uh, class started now. I hope you see, all of you see me. Just trying to, okay, sounds great. So please let me know if you cannot hear me or um, you, you don't see the screen. Okay, otherwise, let's get started. So one quick, um, actually, so we'll be going through several things today, but one quick announcement. So um, I, I actually recorded the uh, video for the, lecture, the first lecture and I'll be recording the, uh, today's video and then all following videos. So I just want you to be aware that um, you, I actually tried to blur the faces in the first video, but then uh, in case you don't want to actually, you know, um, show up in the uh, in the video, then I think it would be better for you to actually, um, you know, mute your video too. So that's one thing. And the um, class website is up. Sorry for the delay. So um, it's here. I also put this on KLMS, so you can actually uh, go to the link. And you will see that the um, there will be a few links. Actually, I will show you that this to you now. That's probably better. Um, let me try to. Okay, so let me just share the. Um... So does everyone see the uh, website? Okay, so um, so now on, I'll probably put everything here except for the important announcements. So when I'm making some announcement, I will be putting that on KLMS, but otherwise everything will be here. So I'll probably stop uploading the lecture slides on the KLMS too. Um, just trying to make a single reference instead of several. So if you wanna, uh, 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 the access the slides and you can go to schedule and materials here. So um, the first lecture slides were here. It's, it's just Google Drive um, PDF like that. Um, today's lecture slides are here too. So if you wanna use that right now, then uh, go ahead. Um, so uh, website address is actually on the KLMS and I'll actually just give you the um, link on the chat right now. Yeah, it's here. Okay. So, um, and I want to actually introduce you to the GitHub discussions. Oh, so videos are on YouTube, by the way. So you can go here and then watch them. Um, that's exactly why. Uh, I, I mentioned that uh, you want to um, maybe mute your video if you don't want to show up here. I actually already blurred the face in the first video. Um, and the GitHub discussions, um, it's basically I'll be Q&A platform. So this is actually a new feature in, the, in, in GitHub. So I'm not sure how it will go, but I think it's quite similar to issues, except that of course, uh, discussions is usually just for discussions and issues are usually for the what happens in the code. So if you have a question, uh, please um, please try to put it on this instead of a personal email to me or TAs because um, many questions will be very uh, redundant. So um, it's and your question will be helpful to others too. So um, I can just go to Q&A here and new discussion. Of course, you will need a GitHub ID. And okay, so that's that. Um, and I put this syllabus here too, so you will um, see all the important things here too. We'll um, put it there too. So um, we'll go back to the slides again. Um, okay. All right, so. Um, lecture videos will be uploaded to YouTube, uh, Q&A here, and 
Um, so again, I'll be using KLMS for um, important announcements. Actually, uh, probably not materials. So you will need to go to the website for the materials. Um, and coding assignment one will be assigned this week, probably by Friday. Um, and will be due in two weeks around um, like third week or fourth week of March. The de details will be out. I'll put the announcement on KLMS soon, but you will get the materials on the website. And uh, one thing, one question I had, one question I got from students, so please feel free to ask questions anytime during lecture. Um, but uh, if you're too shy to speak up, then, I mean, you're welcome to speak up, but if you're too shy, then uh, write on the chat. Um, but if I actually do not see your chat for some reason, then I think TAs uh, can help you. Uh, TAs can uh, let me know if there is a, a question and of course um, speak up um, about the, the question ask. So uh, please ask. I mean, that's really the, um, I think the advantage of having online class instead of just watching YouTube, right? Um, so, okay, I'll put the uh, chat but I'll try to check the chat um, oftentimes. Okay, so um, again, going back to lecture outline. So we'll be recapping uh, a few things, uh, especially uh, what it means to estimate a function and your networks. We did this a bit last, last time. And today we'll be going through um, most of the deep learning basics and um, also the how we can make neural net for image classification as well as text classification. And when we are doing this for text classification, we'll, it's, it's actually necessary to um, talk about how we um, tokenize text and also uh, what it means to have word embedding. So let's, um, let's go through that. All right, so recap. So we talked about, briefly talked about what it means to learn a function or estimate a function. So um, I'll give you a concrete example. So let's say our problem is uh, something like, we want to estimate a function that maps height to weight. So we have a, a few samples that we um, uh, were provided at the left. And we basically want to learn a function that maps, uh, given height, you want to predict what the weight of the person will be. So um, that means then we want to come up with a function that minimizes um, the um, error between the predicted weight and the real weight of the, the, the data points in training data. So uh, with that, uh, I'll write this down. So what we want to do is uh, we want to... Um, find f such that um, average error between, um, let's say that um, each example is x1, x2, x4, and this is y1 and y4 like that, between um, fx, and y is minimized. So does everyone agree with this? So I think hopefully this is clear to everyone. So, um, so there are actually two things we need to be really um, looking into. One is um, f is a function. So um, what do you mean by f? Like what kind of assumption are we gonna make about f, right? So, um, that's like the, the first question we need to ask. And the, the uh, second question is, how, how are we going to compute the average errors? Basically, how are we going to define error and how are we going to define average, right? Because um, there are several types of average. There are, um, most of the times when we say average that we mean by the um, arithmetic average, but then um, in other cases, we're talking about geometric average. Um, error is, of course, also a very um, vague term if you just say it's error, because um, how are you going to define it? Are you just talking about absolute difference as an error, or are you talking about um, something, other, something other than absolute difference? So that's the two things we need to be uh, really careful about, right, about the average error. So we want to define first um, what it means by 
f and um, I also use the uh, another color because that's the good part of using iPad, right? Um, and um, I want to also um, do what it means by, define what it means by average error. So um, that's the two things we need to figure out, right? But you see that this is actually quite generic, right? I mean, um, you can just think of anything. I mean, this definition or this uh, you know, reform reformulation of the problem is applicable to anything, not just height to weight mapping, but really many problems in machine learning. So that's like one way of looking at the machine learning problem. Probably there are more formal ways to define it, but I think this is uh, like personally, like the best way to describe it or think of it. And let's just try to, you know, plot this, right? And um, when we plot this, Um, the height is x and the weight is y. Um, so something like, let's say that this is 160, 165, 170, 175, 180. And we have something like uh, 55, um, you know, 60, 65, 70, and 75. Then if we wanna if we plot this on 2D um, plot, um, then um, the first plot will be 160 and 55. So it will be something like um, um, here, right? And um, the second point X2 and Y2 will be 168 and 62, so something like here. And 173 and 66, so something like here. And 180 and 75 will be something like, like here. So this, this is the training example. And basically we want to be able to uh, use this training example to find a function that you know, um, best describes this relationship between X and Y. So that's really, uh, that's really about what it means to have do a learner function or estimate a function for the given uh, training data. And we discussed in last lecture that um, um, basically this function can be anything, right? I mean, um, you can think of really complex function that fits to all these data points. Like for instance, um, how about something like, you know, like this, right? Like super crazy thing. Why not, right? I mean, it quite fits well, but then I think probably um, that's not correct. And have you ever thought about why you think that's not correct? I mean, is there a reason? Um, so in fact, I mean, if you just look at the data, there is no way that you can uh, say, or, um, you know, in any way scientifically, uh, you know, assert that this green uh, line is wrong. But then we all know that this green line is probably not right. And wh wh why is that so? That's actually because you already have bias about how this should work. And that's what uh, in machine learning we call inductive bias because we, ha we have a pretty good idea that, oh, probably height and weight will be linear or somewhat linear. It will not be something cr as crazy as like this green line. We all know that, oh, probably maybe it's, uh, maybe I don't know, I mean, maybe it's something like a, a really straight linear line like that. Or maybe, um, you know, it might be, kind of uh, kind of like um, flatten out, but still it's uh, somewhat linear, like something like this, but not something like green. So that's what it means to have uh, inductive bias about what F looks like. So um, let's go to that um, uh, slide. So we have uh, some inductive bias that, um, that the X and Y will have uh, somewhat or probably linear relationship, which means we can assume that Y will be um, a function of X uh, in a linear format, uh, double X plus B. Here, uh, everything is scalar. So uh, it's very, um, you know, simple function, but also quite powerful. So let's say we have a double X plus B, then, um, of course, then what that means is um, we can compute the um, fxi 
with this function, right? It's exactly um, Wxi plus b. So we can compute this for all i. Um, so in the uh, uh, previous case, so actually I'll put this here. So um, what I mean by is if you look at this um, table again, um, it will be something like, you know, um, fx1 will be, uh, you have a w that you want to estimate about the function and you have x1, which is 160 plus some bias. It's also what something you want to estimate. You can do this for all values, right? Et cetera. And uh, if we go back to our original definition here, uh, we said that, wait, where did it go? What the, okay, no, never mind. So I think my iPad and this um, drawing is, I just realized not um, synced 100%. So I'll try to figure this out next time. Hopefully it's not too much problem for now, but when I'm drawing something on the um, PDF, it might be off. Like actually I didn't know, but this, x1, x2, x3, I, I intended to write here, but it got off. So um, let me see, I'll be the best way to fix this. Um, that's really weird. Okay. Uh, let me try again. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. I just erased everything. It's so annoying. Uh, okay. okay. Hopefully um, you're okay with looking. So watching the video, um, let me try to Write this again. Okay. Okay. Yeah, for some reason, I think when I'm when I do some resizing or something, I think the all the orientation mixes up. So hopefully, I don't I won't do the uh, resizing until the end of lecture. But um, so just I'll write down one important thing. So I said that um, it's the problem is about uh, find. Um, F such that um, average error between um, Fx, F of X out I and Y I is minimized. That's what we want to do. And I said that there are two things we need to uh, more of more um, more concretely defined, and number one was uh, what it means by f, like what are the uh, uh, how f looks like, and number two was um, what it means by average error, right? And I said that the f we are um, talking about um, some uh, assumptions. We want to make some assumption about how the f looks like, and I said um, we're going to assume that. Um, f x is in a form of w x plus b, which is linear relationship, and we can just plug this number x of i to all these um, to f, uh, f of x to get um, basically. Um, okay, it's really weird. Um, yeah, you see this right? So um, so that. Um, we can plug x ones to these numbers, and we what we want to basically say is that, um, whoa, okay, it's getting crazy. So I'll read, write this down here. So that means then um, we have um, f x one is equal to w of one sixty plus b and etc. Right. 
So that's good. Um, then we uh, go back to this uh, definition here, right? Uh, we said the, uh, we wanna find the average error. So we wanna compare between f of x i and of course, y i, right? Y, y one is equal to 55 and y two is equal to 62. So uh, basically what we wanna compare between is these two. So what is the error between this, right? And of course, we're not just computing one uh, one error for each sample, but we want to compute the average error. So what do you mean? What do you mean by average? So there is actually um, quite um, convenient way of um, um, there is the mathematically convenient way of explaining this. It's called um, um, expectation, but I'll probably not go through that uh, too much details. Uh, but if you want to really learn about that, um, please take uh, deep learning or machine learning classes. Uh, you'll learn a lot about it. Actually, it will be uh, mostly about what it means to uh, actually model the error as an expectation. But for now, think of it as average error. OK, so um, so um, we go to the now the average error. And uh, in many cases, when we are dealing with these um, numbers as the outputs, we are most, most of the times um, working on we want we mostly use the uh, something similar to mean squared error and what is mean squared error so um so basically it's exactly this uh function looks i don't know maybe some for some of you it looks complex but actually it's quite simple right so um it's basically um averaging this is averaging part right and um computing the error right and you see that the, how they compute the error is you just do the negation between two those two numbers. Here the y i is the um, the real labels and y y hat i this is basically f of x i. So you're computing what the difference between um, the f of x i and the um, actual label values. So um, of course y i could be something like. One six cent, one, well, no, about 55 kilograms, and your estimated FXY could be uh, like 54, right? Then the error will be um, one, and then you have to square that, so it will be one squared, it's still one. And you basically just compute that for every i, and you compute, uh, uh, you divide it by number of examples so that you can compute the mean or the average. So then, um, what does that mean? Then basically, um, so we had this table again. So let's go back to this table. Um, so we had this table, right? So it's really, oh my gosh. Apparently this uh, writing gets mixed up so badly. So when I go back and forth, so it's very bad. Probably I'll figure out other ways to use this later. But for now, I think video is the only way to really track these um, uh, handwritings. Okay. so. Just try to save every time or something. Okay. Okay. So what that means then is basically um, we want to compute um, um, error first for each example. So each error will be um, what is it? Um, the y one minus um, f x one which is, is equal to, and of course we have to square that, right? Which is basically equal to um, y1 minus wx1 minus b, right? Of square. Um, so that's basically the, the error, uh, squared error for um, first example. So I'll just put it this e1, right? And we can do the similar thing for e2. Okay, so we do this for all the examples. And what we wanna do is we want to um, sum all these and divide by N to get uh, the final error. So we can compute that error and you, you will see that of course the error is a function of all the examples, um, the training examples, X and Y pairs. 
And what we want to do then now is we, we wanted to find F that minimizes this error, right? So what that means is we want to we want to find W and B. So it'll be a you know two values you want to find that minimizes the um, the that 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 value, right? So it will be uh, some function of x and y's, and you want to minimize it. Um, so does anything? Um, uh, uh, what would be the best way to really find that um, W and B in that case, right? And there are several methods actually, um, especially for linear regression. I mean, this uh, linear um, this uh, learning a function for this linear relationship. Um, but um, one way we can try to find is, of course, we want to maybe uh, try to find analytical solution, right? Analytical solution means that we can uh, try to come up with the exact way of um, uh, defining WMB uh, mathematically. So in that case, that's something like, uh, we can do something like WMB is equal to uh, blah, blah, blah. And there's uh, some uh, training examples and uh, of course, uh, uh, the uh, labels, right? Um, there actually exists an uh, exact solution for linear regression because linear regression is a relatively simple thing. Um, but then in general, of course, um, finding such solution is not um, analytically possible. Um, so you actually, you actually have to uh, approximate it and we'll learn how to do that. I mean, we'll not learn. I mean, we'll talk about later how to do that. Um, details will be probably you wanna, uh, you all probably you, you already know about it. We basically use um, what's called gradient descent. Um, the idea is that of course, in this case, we have two variables, right? W and B, then um, we can draw this on um, some three dimensional um, graph, right? We'll be then drawing some sort of a parabola um, or some three parabola basically. So it'll be something like, oh shoot, uh, something like that. And we basically want to find this, right? Because we want to minimize um, the, the target mean squared error um, and find the W and B what that minimizes this, um, this uh, objective function or the mean squared error. So, and of course, um, if we cannot find that analytically then we want to do gradient descent. Uh, that means that we want to start from uh, somewhere, like say we start from here And then basically uh, compute the slope um, so that we can go to here and then go to here. Um, basically what's called hill climbing or um, it's the reason why it's hill climbing instead of descent is because uh, it's kind of, you can flip this uh, to uh, see it as a, yeah. Wait. Yeah. Okay, so, all right. So um, the next next thing is that the um, we want to go to the um, what is it? Let's play. Okay. So next thing is that um, we 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 now we now see what the regression is, right? Basically, that's um, um, when we have the output is a real is a real number. So we had a weight as a kilogram, right? Um, so. Apparently that announcement is so annoying. Okay, just I'll wait for it. Okay, my bad. Yeah, there was a really long announcement that I don't know why they're like announcing every day. Um, so let's go now into this regression thing. So, so I told you that this output is a real number, right? So um, in this case, that's 
that's not too um, complicated, right? We you saw that uh, you basically can just um, compute the difference between um, the predicted output and um, your actual out your actual label in training data. So that's that's nice. But then when the output is a label, I mean, basically it's a categorical label instead, it's not a number. Something like, for instance, we're not really interested in the exact number, but we're interested more about, is it above 60 or is it below 60, something like that. Then it becomes a classification problem. It's no more a regression problem. Um, and usually actually in deep learning, probably you will encounter more classification problem than regression. Um, just because actually um, there are, I think, classical tasks, there are more classical tasks than regression. I'm not saying regression is um, um, more, you know, more or less important, but um, it's easier to think of it as we're going from regression to classification uh, because we've, everything in regression is real number, but in classification now, things are not anymore real number, but more categorical, right? More discrete. So um, we can think of it as how can we move from regression to classification? So. Uh, number one is that we can threshold after regression. So we can maybe train a model uh, using regression data, just like how we did. And then we can try to just threshold it, right? So the easiest way of course is that um, here, um, because we're our label is something like above 60 and below 60. So you can just say that um, we um, output above 60 if um, Y is above 60. So basically it's something like this, right? and below 60 otherwise. But in many cases, this is not super convenient, um, mostly because sometimes what you're trying to classify is not quantifiable. I mean, in, in, when you're trying to predict weight, at least the weight is quantifiable. But in many cases, for instance, if you want to classify cat and dog, there is no, no such thing as like a, some number that tells you like how um, likely uh, certain images, uh, dog or um, a cat in a real number. Um, from human perspective, I mean, you cannot really say that uh, a cat image is like 95, um, you know, the score that the this cat image will be cat is like 95. It's kind of not even, um, you know, intuitive. It's easier for people, to, for us to ask people whether this is cat or dog. So that's why um, in many cases, we use the probabilistic model instead to actually model these, um, um, this, uh, to model and learn these functions. So, so maybe now things are getting a bit more complicated on, 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 than the, uh, the previous cases. So um, regression was y equal fx, right? But in probabilistic model for classification, you're defining this a bit differently. Um, so of course, regression was that here, the um, x, this is a real number, and y is also a real number. But when you're, you're doing the uh, classification, here the, uh, the variable y is no more a real number. This is actually um, either a or b, for instance, uh, if we're talking about two classes, um, of course we can have like uh, 10 classes or 100 classes, but let's say we have two classes. In that case, y is either a or b. And we're uh, we're, we made this y into random variable so that we can uh, do probabilistic um, um, modeling instead of uh, purely in functional space. And now what you want to compute the uh, probability that y equal to a. And we want to model that uh, with a function that uh, uh, we, can, we, want to, we, we want to estimate. So it's a bit different. You, you need to see the difference here uh, that previously we, we used the function to directly estimate the output but now we're not actually using functions to directly estimate the output, which is actually not possible because uh, the output is not a, a real number. Function is always operating in real number uh, if you wanna make it differentiable, right? Um, but then now you're actually using the function uh, here f of a to model the probability instead. And here you're modeling f a, um, using FA to model the probability of Y being A, and you're using F of B for probability of being, um, you know, B, and et cetera. So um, then, um, then things get clear, right? Then it means that now what you wanna do, um, 
then your definition of finding a function becomes a bit different. Um, so you now, whether that you want to find a function that minimizes the error, uh, here's a diff the important difference. Instead of minimizing the error, now your um, objective becomes, you want to find um, uh, f of a, f of b, um, these functions, such that the likelihood of the training data is maximized. So um, what that means is that um, mathematically, you basically want to now, uh, oh my gosh. Okay, you wanna instead um, find f, and, uh, f of a and f b such that if uh, for each example, uh, you will have some probability, right? So for instance, um, uh, what is the, um, okay, so more concretely something like this, right? Uh, what is actually, so more concretely, you have to actually condition on x. So um, you want to find, actually, I'll be more concrete. You want to find what the probability of y be, be, being a given x equal to xi. And that is basically what you want to model. But um, what you want to now maximize is basically um, probably y being y1 here, uh, y1 is actual label for the example number one, um, given x equal to x of one, right? So that's exactly um, the, actually, so to be more exact, actually, this should be uh, the, uh, the inverse y because what you're trying to estimate is the uh, likelihood, but I'm just giving you the really the the the, um, the, the overall idea here. Um, so when, when you want to talk about more of a posterior function um, and the posterior probability, um, again, uh, go to the deep learning and machine learning class. Hopefully, you find the um, really the details here. I'll be just really briefly going through, but the basically the idea is that instead of modeling the the real uh, the regression um, directly here, because it's no more um, you know where the regression is more classification. Now you're trying to um, maximize the likelihood um, because we're now operating everything in public space. Okay, that's great. So um, that's very good. But then now here, uh, here's another problem, right? So the issue here is that, okay, that's really good. But how can we enforce that the f of x is always between zero and one? Because, you know, um, the probability of um, a certain thing is always between zero and one. But if you use just Wx plus b, it's unbounded. It can be either positively infinite or negatively infinite, either way. So that's really the problem here. So that's where the softmax function comes in. So um, in softmax, um, what we can do instead to for the classification is um, we still uh, use the linear regression, for instance, we or we can use something else, but we can just basically uh, have a, some function that maps the x to some uh, unbounded values. So for simplicity, you can think of it as linear uh, linear function, but it doesn't have to be linear function. You can be just anything. Um, it can be very complex neural networks too. But at the end, what we want to do is suppose that, so um, I'll just use G to um, actually um, indicate um, number before softmax. So suppose that um, we, okay, we, I'm going to write this again. So I want to model um, Y being a given um, x uh, equal to x um, as suppose um, actually I'll go the other way actually my bad um, so I'll I'll I'll, I'll actually uh, try I'll propose this uh, and then you will see why this is very handy so 
I'll model this way. So how I'm going to model this is um, I'm going to um, let me see. Exponent exponentiate um, and uh, do something with uh, x of g, right? G is uh, some function that I'm going to do something with x. Um, and then um, I'll put a here because it's um, for class a. And what I'm going to do is I have a uh, in, on, in the uh, in the denominator uh, I put the same value here exponentiation of g of a of x but I also have another uh, the the other labels um, function b of x. So what does this do? So basically, what this means is. Um, G of A of X can be unbounded function, just like, uh, for instance, we can just think of it as um, something like W X plus B. And this is unbounded, right? This can be either go uh, positively infinite or negatively infinite. But then uh, you can plug this into exponentiation. And what the exponentiation does is, as you know, um, you basically have always positive number. So, um, exponentiation basically kind of does the positive, uh, make everything into positive in a smooth way, right? And then now you have uh, two positive numbers and you, uh, you, you, uh, you have a uh, G, G, G A of X and G B of X uh, with exponentiated. Um, and then you basically uh, put this summation as denominator and use the numerator um, for the, one of uh, the um, G, G of A or G of B. So of course, um, if you want to compute the probability of, of uh, um, y being b given x equal x, will be um, the numerator will be different, but this will be same. And what's nice about this property is um, if you do this way, then first of all everything is positive, so there is not nothing really special. I mean, nothing really bad thing happening here. Everything is positive. Um, so, and also um, if G is bigger uh, for the, like certain class like A, then you will get higher uh, probability, right? So it's very nice um, that if you have G, G of A that's much bigger than G of B, then you have a really good, prop, good uh, property that, um, that, that probability that your model will be also corresponding to that difference. And another really uh, important aspect of this um, formulation is that if you sum these two probabilities, then you'll always equal to one. Um, and I just show you a case for two labels, A and B, but in general, you can just enumerate uh, several different classes like um, 10, 100, 1000, and you can, can still do the same way, right? You just have a lot of uh, values in the denominator. If you wanna do, you know, probably of Y equals C, then what, what, what are you gonna do instead? then what you want to do is that you just put here, um, oh. what, you just put G of C of X, right? And then you can also compute, of course, um, Um, same way. And again, you can just sum all these and then you can get 1.0. So that's like a handy way of uh, uh, trans translating real numbers into uh, probability of different categories or classification. Okay. Okay. So I'm gonna just pause for um, uh, three minutes. We're gonna have a, a short rest and then I'll start at 3.20, um, go for another 30 minutes of the second part of the lecture. Just so stretch yourself, uh, have a rest for like three minutes and then uh, please come back.
Okay, um, I'll get started again in a few seconds. And um, the rest of the lecture will be covering, I don't think we can go through everything today. So um, neural nets, image classification, and hopefully up to um, text tokenization. Yep. Okay, let's get started. All right, so, okay. So hopefully now everyone's familiar with the, um, now knows what softmax is. So the softmax was basically um, putting the exponentiation on um, the um, numbers to make it uh, publicistic. So um, I'll, I'll actually give you one additional um, way different view of how the softmax function can be viewed. So um, let's say we have a three classes, right? Three classes, then um, we'll have a, for each input x, we have um, three values. So W, um, w a x plus b of a uh it's actually confusing now okay so kind of mixed up the um, notations okay so let's say class label is one two three so then um for the class label one we have a um, um, w one x plus b and for class label two you have w2 x plus b and for class label three w3 x plus b right and um the point here is that these values will be um unbounded at all right just uh like any real number this can be and we want to transform this into pro probabilistic number, right? And some value that um, it will be always between zero and one. And also the summation will be 1.0. And the one way this is not the only way, but one way that people found, and it's quite effective way, is as I, as I have just shown you, we just exponentiate each value and uh, sum the exponential values um, and basically divide these two numbers to get the final probability um, to um, and get the uh, this um, transformation, right? So that is uh, exactly what's called softmax. So that's one other way to view this. <clears throat> yep, so um, that's that. Okay. Oh, my bad. No, <laughs> yeah, thanks for the uh, pointing out. No, no, it's not. I mean, you can make it, but it doesn't have to be. So um, in, 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 in linear algebra, actually, this is quite uh, easy to uh, write down. So what you can do is um, you basically have X and what you can do, you can basically make this into, um, you know, um, linear algebra equation, right? Because this B1 to B3 can be vector. So, oh, my writing is so bad. So like that. Right, and you can also make this W into a vector two. And you can basically do that. And you want to learn these weights and biases, but sometimes if you wanna share uh, parameters, then of course it can be same too. Instead of B1, B2, B3, you can just have a, um, or just one B sometimes. And sometimes this parameter sharing can help. Um, 
Okay. So wait. Neural nets. Okay, so let's go into now a more complex function. So what we just saw is a single layer of neural net. And um, you can make this more complex by um, having uh, several layers of neural nets, right? So um, for now, um, let's assume that uh, we only have um, um, one type of uh, activation function for those of you who already know what the activation function is. So uh, we'll just assume that we only have value. So, um, so what I mean by value or activation function, I'll get to that really soon. So um, now suppose that input um, value is um, arbitrarily um, long. So we are just assuming until now that X is always uh, you know, a single digit, single number, single, single scalar, but of course it doesn't have to be single scalar. It can be um, two, three hundred, um, you know. So um, let's assume that now instead of uh, x being scalar value, let's say x is a vector. So in that case, then x will be here. It's two values, so x will be, um, um, you know, vector of two dimensions. Now we're going to use linear algebra to make everything uh, much easier to compute, or I mean, easier to uh, write down. Otherwise, I'll have to you know every time write every value. So um, now we have x being um, you know two-dimensional vector. We want to now do the uh, assume as if um, the um, Okay, so assume as if it's first of all, first it's one layer um, neural network. So let's just look at this part. Because now X becomes two dimensional things change a bit. So now you're not just computing um, two, for instance, let's say we want to compute um, this value, right? This. Um, Let's say that this is uh, Z, Z1. Um, it, it's quite similar to how we did for the Y, right? But then um, the difference is that now we have to actually compute um, uh, four different Z values. And if you wanna compute Z1, you're not just using um, X1 to, uh, to obtain that. So if, you, if we did the same thing what we did uh, previously, it would be something like this, right? something like that. But uh, we're not doing that anymore because we have two um, uh, values in X. So we're gonna instead use um, linear algebra um, to um, obtain Z um, as a, um, the vector. So I'm not actually differentiating notation between X and Z. I mean, no, not hex and z, notation between vector and scalar, because from now on, everything, unless otherwise noted, will be by default uh, vector, uh, not scalar values. Um, I mean, it can be uh, vectors or um, scalar values. No, it could be vectors um, in general. So, um, so to compute z, what we're going to do is um, z is basically uh, z1, z2, z3 z4 and um, it z can be computed by here's the uh, matrix multiplication um, so let me try to do this um, so there are some values um, uh, four values uh, in the uh, axis of the um, um, in uh, vertically um, no, not four values, my bad. So actually it's, this is like where the, all the confusion happens because the matrix uh, multiplication is not um, uh, same direction as the, uh, how the like uh, PyTorch or TensorFlow works. So that's why you can be, can be a bit confusing. But um, basically you first wanna have X here. So here, and you do matrix multiplication with the um, 
basically four by two matrix. What that means is that um, X1 and X2 will be uh, inner product of this um, and this, this and this. And of course we have bias, right? So we want to add um, bias Um, so um, we usually call this W and this B. And of course this was X, right? So in other words, it's Z is um, X, W plus B, right? I think that's, um, let me just try to see. Yep. Okay, that's great. Um, of course, um, there are other ways to uh, view this too. Um, you can sometimes uh, transpose things to uh, write it down as Wx plus b. So it doesn't really matter. I mean, the, the, um, the uh, orientation doesn't really matter much. Uh, what, what, what really matters is that basically you get the point of uh, how this linear algebra works. So then, um, now we have the hidden layer Z defined. And then I'm gonna compute the final output layer. I'll call this Y. And Y will be um, Z um, of, uh, let me see. So I'll, I'll use a superscript to indicate this layer one. And I'm gonna use a second, oh, my bad. second layer W plus um, B to get Y. Then um, now you have um, basically the, the simplest neural network. But do you see anything really uh, uh, not good here? So actually what happens if you do this way is that actually if you compute this, you can actually uh, reduce this down to um, just um, y equal to x of some w plus uh, b of some, um, uh, uh, no, w, w prime and b prime for some numbers. Because if you just do linear transformation on top of linear transformation, it's just one step of linear transformation. I think that's like a, the one of the core, um, you know, lessons you learn from the linear algebra class. So what that means is that even if you have about several layers, it'll be just linear, everything's linear. So you're not gonna make anything interesting on top of this uh, dip um, function. But then you want this function to be able to model really complex things, right? So what um, that's like the really core part of your network is that instead of just stopping here, you insert a very, uh, very um, simple, but yet very effective and very important layer in the middle of um, Z and Y which is called activation function. And that's making this nonlinear and being able to model nonlinear things um, enables neural network to actually uh, uh, model nonlinear things. And uh, hopefully, again, um, hopefully you learn this or you will learn this in machine learning class pretty soon. So what actually happens is that instead of modeling Y as just Z of the, oh my gosh. Oh man. Yeah, I'm sorry, like this thing is so unstable. So I'll probably try to find another way to um, write this on the PDF. Uh, what I'm trying right now looks like very unstable. So maybe I just already also lost this, all these like writings. But um, hopefully uh, you got the point that um, Z is equal to C, everything just disappeared. Um, I'll really quickly write this down again. So instead of doing this way, um, what we do is actually, no. Um, 
we basically have a simple nonlinearity. In, the, in this case, what we, we, our people call value. And value is just, um, um, value of x is just uh, max between uh, zero and x. And you see, it looks like this. So z will be uh, after the activation, which will be just max of uh, zero and um, x w first layer plus um, bias of first layer. And y will be just z of w two plus b two. And of course, we have only one value for the y here. I mean, it doesn't have to be, in this case it's one, but it can be two or three. So that will really, uh, you know, affect the size of the matrix w um, and also size of the vector b. And of course, if you want to do um, two-way classification that we want the y to be uh, two, not just one, right? So suppose that we have one more Um, then this y will be um, two-dimensional, two right? Something like that. And then um, we're going to use this. Um, if this were working on, of course, um, um, classification, let's say this corresponds to um, cat, this corresponds to um, dog, then we're gonna use the softmax we just talked about in the previous slide to uh, transform y into um, probabilistic value. So in that case, then of course, um, the probability of um, probability of um, cat is equal to um, exponentiation of uh, y1 over exponentiation of y1 um, plus exponentiation of y2. Um, I mean, here, y1 will be this value, y2. Oh. I'll just use different color. So that's clear. Um, and um, probably of dog will be exponentiation of y2 over exponentiation of y1 plus. And here y1, of course, is uh, this is um, this vector corresponds to y1, y2 concatenated. Okay, so finally, we are now, we have covered um, the, all the, uh, the core things in deep neural networks. So if you just um, do this like several times, like 10 times, 100 times, uh, 1000 layers, hopefully then you will have super deep neural networks um, in play. Okay. Um, so I think we can now go into image classification then. How can we use to um, classify an image using this kind of neural nets? And it's actually quite simple because it happens to be that the image, the really good property of image is that image is actually um, can be considered as a collection of real numbers. So this is a data set called MNIST. Um, basically, you see that there is a list of images, and each image um, to humans looks like either 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So there are 10 classes. Um, and we want to create a model that gets this image as an input, and we want to output one of the 10 classes or labels, right? So it's, it's uh, um, fortunately, image is actually a, um, a basically a vector. That's a good thing. Um, so we can just use that as an input and put it into the neural networks. And so as I've told you, 
image is just a 28 by 28 by one uh, grayscale image. And when I say grayscale, that means is that this is one. This is actually called channel. Um, sometimes uh, people put channel at the at the front when they're doing the more of a CUDA uh, programming because that was the convention. Um, but um, uh, in the when you just use your Mac or Windows to open an image, usually um, they don't show up, or if if they show up, they're actually at the last um, position. So this means the size is twenty eight. Um, there are twenty eight pixels. Twenty eight pixels height. 28 pixels uh, width, and the, each pixel is just a value between um, zero and one for now. Um, this it, it also depends on the format of image. If it's, uh, for instance, in some format, you will have a zero, zero to 255 integer, and zero to 255 integer is basically just, um, um, you know, um, eight bit number, right? So you use, um, 8-bit int 8 to encode that. But if you translate that into um, um, number between 0 and 1, then there will be uh, just um, you know, um, some, um, some uh, sub, what do you call, um, some float number that you, instead, instead of using int 8, you will use um, uh, float 16 or float 32 to encode it. For now, let's assume that this is actually zero to one. So that means um, if MNIST image is 28 by 28 by one, um, why is 20 by 28 times 28, right? Let me just compute that. So that means um, each image is uh, 784 numbers of float. So we can think of each example as It's very annoying. I just okay. Okay, sorry about that. My iPad gets, you know, it keep closing. It keeps closing the um, PDF for some reason. Okay, so what that means is that you can think of each image as um, um, vector. X, which is in the dimension of um, 784. So you, you remember this, um, that um, neural network figure here? So we had this, right? Um, that we had two um, inputs at X. That's why we were saying X belongs to um, real number of uh, power of two. But um, in our case now, we just increase that number from two to 784. Um, and basically then in neural network, this will be of course super large, so I'm not gonna draw it, but then something like you have all this input um, as a input, I mean, this like input, um, you know, nodes, neural net nodes, and you will have some hidden layers and another hidden layers and maybe other hidden layers, right? Um, so, and then um, lastly, we will have um, numbers for each class. So in that case, we'll have just uh, 10 nodes. So this will correspond to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero, right? Um, these are the, uh, um, the, the final node for classification. So what we want to map this to is basically a Y of um, a real number um, of, actually, I'm not, I'm not going to use Y because it will be very confusing here. So I'll, because I'll be using um, a notation. So I think i mixed up the notation a bit. Sorry about that. But hopefully you get the point that basically, um, I'll use um, notation of, um, let me see. Mm. This will be um, just, uh, I'll call that uh, L and that will be um, the real number of um, in dimension 10. And um, 
you just build this neural networks. Um, you might have like two or three or three layers with this activation in the middle. So I think you get the point. And um, after that, now you want to compute the probability from these uh, numbers. And the reason why I put L is because people usually call these number final normals logits. Uh, this is logits. And then you use a softmax to, uh, of course, um, make this into a really bad at drawing. Um, into um, something that's in um, in the in the uh, range of zero to one. And of course, this probably distribution, so everything has to uh, sum to 1.0. So that's how you would be doing image classification. Um, quite simple, right? Of course, there. Are, um, if you want to go more advanced ways, then you use CNN, convolution neural networks, or you might want to use um, more something more fancy these days, such as transformer. But uh, that's exactly, I mean, it, at the end, you, if you understand this, then you'll be able to understand uh, convolutional neural nets or transform um, in a very similar way. Um, it's just giving you more um, inductive bias into the architecture. You're making more assumptions about the neural networks than uh, like such a the simplest way, like just making this into a, you know several layers of a fully connected neural nets is probably the, the least uh, inductive bias you're giving to the model. Okay, so um, that's how you make an image classifier. So I have now three minutes, um, but now I'll go into the uh, text classification then, and. What's the problem with text classification? So can we use a similar algorithm for uh, um, text classification that what we just use for image? Um, when I'm saying text classification, um, in this case, maybe something like, uh, can we classify this review into um, three classes? Um, or I'll say just two classes for now. Uh, good review or bad review. And what I mean by is that, does it mean it's a good review? Okay. Probably this review means that the movie was bad because it's saying that who said this was a good movie? Very sarcastic. Um, but so at least the output is um, there are two two classes. So this is a class, classification task apparently. So we might be able to use a similar algorithm just we use for image. Um, or but then the problem here is that actually not on the output side, but the input side. And can you guess what the problem with the input side? There are actually two problems. Number one, um, the fact that inputs are not real numbers. So these are, you know, of course, you can think of it as a real numbers if you put this as a, um, you know, transform this ASCII number, but these ASCII numbers are so not, um, intuitive that it's really hard to use. So text is not really real numbers. So you cannot really use these uh, inputs uh, easily. Um, that's number one. And number two is that inputs are not fixed size because you can have super long text unlike MNIST, at least here we had a fixed image size. And when images have a different sizes, you can resize it. But text, you cannot really resize it, right? That's where the um, the the difference between image and um, I'll say um, text comes from, and also uh, where uh, NLP and computer vision differ a lot. Um, although these days, actually, they are actually converging a bit um, with uh, advancements such as transformer. But we'll get we'll get to that later. But for now, it looks quite different, right? So inputs are not real numbers, and inputs are not fixed size. So what what do we need some tools to make this into real numbers, and we need to, we need some tool to make this um, um, into more of a fixed size, or at least like a, some things are fixed size. Um, not everything, but at least the important things are fixed size. So uh, for number one, we're going to use what's called word embedding. And for number two, we're going to use, um, um, for now, what's called recurrent neural network. 
And for those of you who are not, uh, who haven't heard of this, uh, have you heard of um, LSTM, RNN, GRU? These are all recurrent neural networks. I mean, actually, RNN is actually what uh, recurrent neural, uh, RNN stands for recurrent neural, net, neural networks. Um, so all these are um, in RNN, and LSTM or NGRU is a one instance of one instance of RNN. Basically, what they do is they're enabling you to handle arbitrarily long uh, sequence as an input. Okay, so um, um, now it's three fifty. So um, the I'm running out of time. So I think I'll just end here. Um, so we'll be going into this word embedding and RNN in the next class uh, on Wednesday. So I'll see you guys, see you um, on Wednesday and hopefully I'll get the assignment out uh, by Thursday or Friday so that you can, um, you can start the assignment soon. The assignment will be actually about uh, creating on RNN more specifically, probably LSTM to um, um, do text classification on PyTorch. Okay, so everyone, um, thanks, thanks for um, coming to class. Hopefully um, um, everything was okay and I'll see you next week. I mean, not next week, uh, on Wednesday.